Coming up this week on Beyond the Vibe podcast, we're joined by Cradle of Filth guitarist Richard Shaw. If you learn these two songs, he even said today is actually the deadline, but seeing as you've only heard about the audition today, we'll give you a few more days. Uh, me being me was like, well, if the deadline's today, I'll do it today. Really, I was really lucky because the first song I wrote, uh, which was a song that ended up becoming... It ended up getting on the album uh, Hammer of the Witches, the first album I was on. That got a one word review from our drummer, and that word was shit. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because it's especially because we got a new keyboard player in as well, and she was very hands on with the writing and very up for collaborating, and it was very true that there was all six of us writing, like and firing on all cylinders. Everybody struggled. Oh, you look like you say motherfucker with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Beyond the Vibe, the show that cuts deep into the world of music. My name is Aaron Day, lead guitarist of UK band These Wicked Rivers, and I'm here. He wasn't expecting the. Oh, turn. I got you again. I love You're it. Doing it again. Yeah. I'm doing it on purpose. I wait, <laughs> and then I'll see when he presses the button. I'm like, "Kisha!" <laughs> which is my victory noise. Uh, I'm here with music videographer, photographer, it's Mr. Ryan Basic. It is. How you doing? Oh, we're doing good, aren't we? It's, it's been bloody hot. Yes. Yeah, tell well, you what. Tell you and your velvet and your hot in pants. In velvet aren't you? and uh, hot pants, just for people there. I mean, I'm committing. Um, I had to f- like feel like I was fitting in this week, in particular, because uh, uh, yeah, this this week we've gone a little bit different, haven't we? We have. Yeah, I thought we were having <laughs> the band Acra on, which is why I dressed mainly in blue, <laughs> and then I late found out that we've got actually Cradle of Filth, mm. Mister in particular, Mister Richard Shaw, the guitarist. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, it's, one. it's cool though. Mm. I think it's nice to have a different dynamic thrown in there. You know, we've got a lot of the new wave of yeah. classic rock love at the minute. Uh, shout out to Jeremy if you're watching. Mm. A horrible little seductive. <laughs> Uh, and you complained to me last week for sounding too sexual I I am sexual so it's alright you know it's it's not creepy when I do it no offence where's Jeremy you can thank me for that for the nightmares later on but yeah I think it's nice because it gives a different dynamic and obviously Rich as well like a lot of the bands that we chat to are obviously like on a similar level um, Mm. or a tiny bit higher and are going up that pyramid whereas obviously Rich and Cradle are are playing sold out shows you know all around the world and it's, it's no, it's very interesting getting that insight especially from somebody like going from session musician to band member in a very well established band you know it's, it's interesting mm. man yeah he, he's definitely the most diverse um, musician I've seen to yes, date definitely but to go from because he can do a mixture of like just musicals and mm. he's doing death metal you know extreme death metal and cradle it's, uh, I can do it mm. I can really I haven't got the technical ability to be able like I'm a, a hard rock and a blues guitarist you know so I'd really struggle to just slip into that dynamic so it's a credit to his playing and I think the biggest credit to his personality mm. is to be able because he seems to be the perfect personality to slip into that dynamic you know we've seen the interviews some of the feedback he had about them his own material that he brought <laughs> to the band early on and he took that really well wanted to find out about how he could fit it into the cradle dynamic and he seems like the perfect personality for that how would you, how would you cope with that Mr Vasey say you're a session guitarist <laughs> session guitarist here we go so phone rings yeah <laughs> and you pick it up and it's uh, and it's, it's I don't know it's John Bon Jovi he's getting <laughs> out of him, right? I don't know why he'd be calling me he's, but... calling, he's seen the pa- he's seen the trousers of course he's seen the trousers like, I've seen the trousers it's hot today isn't it and you've got, yeah you look really hot John it's really hot John <laughs> he said what do you want because I'm watching Taggart this is the situation he said I want you to join Bon Jovi like how would you feel going into that dynamic you know I think it's different with a classic mm. band because it's at that point you know John's the, the geezer yeah. it's Cradle I mean they've been around since the 90s but it's a, it's a different dynamic you know, what if what if Blackstone Cherry had you as their new bass player that's a question how would you feel going into that that arena it's it would be it's a different dy- dynamic isn't it like you're the new guy um, it's an established in an established band and it is it's the same you know different bands completely but it, it is it is the same with the uh, cradle because you know he's coming into a band that's been around a long long time um and i suppose you have to kind of manage that situation and kind of you know be be reasonable with it because it, you know you're the new guy yeah um but um 
yeah i mean we'll, we'll dive into that in a moment but yeah it's i think he, he dealt with it in the best fashion mm, definitely that you could um you could do. i couldn't do any better <laughs> i'd struggle <laughs> i think balance and and you know baby steps working mm. out what works and what doesn't and not being too i mean i didn't start writing lyrics for rivers until eden you know, which yeah. came out last year so it's and the band's you know seven years at this point so it's it's took a long time for me to really express myself in that way you know and mm. so it does take a long time to to not be the new guy or to or to really cement yourself and build it's all about relationships and trust between people particularly like with Danny as the leader mm. of that band you know just building having him giving you the room and you having the trust with him you know but it is interesting and insightful and the thing that I need to know Mr. Vase mm. if people want to hear about that <laughs> when can they hear about that people can hear about that <laughs> now <laughs> so we're here with the beautiful Mr. Richard Shaw of Craig of Filth how are you doing brother I'm doing alright how are you guys you're alright yeah we're good we're we're well. Well. Yeah, struggling with the sun yes uh, leather yeah. pants do not go well in sun. <laughs> I've made this commitment now, though, and I'm regretting it. They don't, they don't smell good in sun either. Just, to, <laughs> just put that out there. Oh, dear. Um, so one thing that we like to do on the show, uh, Richard, is uh, we like to go right back to the beginning of uh, a musician's journey. So how did it all start for you as a guitarist? Good question. I grew up kind of like a general rock and roll blues and rockabilly fan thanks to my grandparents and i was always i was told i was always naturally drawn to the guitar like even when there's a guitar solo I, apparently i was always like getting excited when the guitar solo would come on or there'd be a little cool little guitar bit and i'd be like oh, what's that what's that apparently uh, but when i was 11 i got a guitar because I, I kept bugging my mum and dad for a guitar for Christmas, like every year for about three or four years. And when I was 11, I finally got one. And uh, the impetus for that was because I just basically massively got into Queen, the Beatles and Metallica. So it was like that weird summer between finishing primary school and secondary school. It was almost like I was a a rock and roll fan, but then was influenced by the pop of the time. Um, and then all of a sudden that summer I became a full, fully fledged rocker, I suppose. Um, and I just wanted to play guitar so badly. Uh, and then this is really sad. January 7th, 1997, after getting a, a guitar off the previous Christmas, I had my first guitar lesson and I've pretty much just played constantly since then and just took it more and more seriously thinking, right, okay, I could fingers crossed turn this into a career and all that and it was pretty much the only thing i wanted to do was play guitar play music for a living so that's it in a nutshell i'm glad i like the fact that you knew the, the day so specific day. Big fan that of is bad, isn't it? Like, i know no, that. I mean, we like that but that's, that's my, fun. <laughs> my memory my missus will tell you my memory is shocking but there's like stuff like that in my life where it's like why do i know that but i can't remember why after dinner you know what i mean it's really so weird you your brain it was a monumental day you know the day i was like right how do i hold this thing what, what right what do i do right <laughs> and uh that was it i was hooked from that moment on how, how was your transition as well as in terms of learning guitar rich because for me personally my first four years were really challenging and i was i was trying to be a singer to be honest because i struggled so much and then i had that bit of a breakthrough did you take to it sort of straight away and felt that progression or did you have that initial sort of head banging head against the wall uh i think i was very lucky because some aspects i picked up really quickly like when it comes to playing chords for some reason i found playing chords relatively easy it kind of made sense but when it came to like single note melodies and riffs i remember that was like banging my head against the wall that <laughs> took a lot of time um so for the longest time i thought i'm just going to be a, a rhythm guitar player not not even play riffs just play just play chords and i'll be fine uh but, but then one day it started to click and i just i was like well i really want to play this like the queen of metallica kind of stuff and you know lead guitar players a bit more sexy than rhythm playing. <laughs> I, thought, I thought at the time it was and then i realized they're just as sexy as each other really but in very different ways so i love playing both but yeah i did struggle with with lead guitar and just single note melodies and stuff i really struggled with that for the longest time 
Yeah, it's all about that progression, isn't it? Now, most people obviously know you for Cradle of Filth. Obviously, you've had Emperor Chung and NG26 along the way. But for the band, most people know your voice, Cradle. So how did that whole process come about from joining Cradle of Filth? That was a weird one. It was kind of like if it wasn't for NG26 and Emperor Chung, I wouldn't have joined. Because very early on in the early NG26 days, we actually started doing um, an EP round at this guy's house because uh, we didn't know anybody who had a studio and we couldn't afford the big studios. And so this is like a guy who had his home studio back back then in, God, what year would this have been? About 2000, 2001, when a home studio was, like everyone's got a home studio now, or at least a laptop and something to record something on you know but back then it was like oh my god this guy can he can record stuff in his bedroom what the hell that sounds weird when i say it out loud like um <laughs> but he can record audio i should say um and, and that guy was later became the sound guy for cradle of filth wow so that was through the ng26 connection and we stayed in touch over the years because he ended up doing a lot of the musical theater stuff he was doing sound for musical theater that i was playing guitar in uh so we kept bumping into each other over the years and then i met him backstage at download 2013 when emperor chung played it and he introduced me to people who, who would been crewing for Cradle and Lacoon Coil and all these bands he works with. And then about six months later, that's when I got a call from him saying, well, Cradle are looking for a guitar player because their guitar player doesn't want to do the tour. Um, we've been looking forever without officially announcing Cradle Phil's looking for a guitar player who wants to go for it. So we st- the, apparently the band and management started asking the crew if they knew anybody, and that's when he put my name forward. Mm. Um and, and that was it, really. Got me in touch with a tour manager, and the tour manager gave me a really quick interview over the phone. Uh, and he asked about my experience. And ironically, had I not played Download 2013, I probably wouldn't have got the job because he was worried I didn't have enough experience playing on the bigger stages. Um, so this is what I mean. Without Engine 26 and Prachung, I wouldn't have been in Cradle. It's as simple as that, really. It's amazing, isn't it, Like when you look back on all them themes because there's so much little things that have linked together to, to draw that path that's eventually led you to, to Cradle. Mm. And originally, when you, when, you, when you joined at that point, were you just coming in for, to do the tour and then it kind of built from there? That, that, that was it. I was literally brought on board, as far as I'm aware, because I wasn't sure of what the inner workings of Cradle were at the time, but I was under the impression I was coming in as a session guy, learn the songs, uh, but basically, I auditioned. They got, the tour manager got me in touch with the drummer, who was like, basically, learn these two songs. And he even said, today is actually the deadline, but seeing as you've only heard about the audition today, we'll give you a few more days. Uh, me being me was like, well, if the deadline's today, I'll do it today. And apparently, I was the only guy who handed in the audition tape in on time. And I was like asking people all over the world for about six weeks if they would do it, and nobody did it. Uh, so I still to this day think I only got the job because I was the only guy who handed in the audition tape on time. <laughs> so it pays to be punctual. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just under the impression after that when I got the call saying, right, okay, here's the set list. See you on this day for rehearsals, and then we go off on tour, like literally a day after rehearsals. Uh, it was literally like a one day rehearsal, and that was that was it. Play the first show. Um, so it was like being thrown in at the deep end. And I was like, well, I'm glad I did it. It's an amazing thing to put on the CV. Thank you very much. Good luck with the rest of your touring and your right now. But and then on the when I'd done that last show on the way back from which was in Berlin, March first, 2014. Was Berlin. <laughs> <Right> <laughs> um, like I say, my memory's shocking. Apart from tour dates, it's really weird. Um, <laughs> It's my Rain Man thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's my special power. But, um, yeah, so that was coming back on the way with Berlin. So this would have been March 2nd. We were coming back on the tour bus, and Danny was like, you did enjoy it, didn't you? I was like, yeah, I loved it. I got to, like, pretend rock star for a, for a month around <laughs> Europe. It was amazing. He says, well, would you like to keep doing it? Because Paul's not coming back. I was like, yeah. He says, do you write? I was like, Yeah. 
not like regular filth. I don't, but I write, yeah. <laughs> like, kind of almost blagging it, going, it was like, cool, well, we're going to start writing the next new album like next week so if you've got any ideas send them over and and that was pretty much my way of being told yeah you're in the band um and obviously i've been with them ever since fortunately okay. <laughs> that's amazing i think that's that, uh, for you to go through that because obviously we, we talk a lot but we never had that conversation i bet that that rush of excitement you felt when when danny was was like do you want to do it do you want to do it like all, all the time? time. Yeah. I bet it was amazing. It, it was. Uh, it, it was one of those things where I, di I didn't know whether to take him seriously or not. Because <laughs> having got to know him on that tour, he is a bit of a joker. And I thought, if, it, if you're joking, this is a really, really horrible joke. <laughs> yeah, Because <laughs> you know I mean? he almost said it in a way where I thought, there's going to be a punchline in a minute. And, and he was like, no, I'm deadly serious. If you want to stay, we, we want you on board. And, and that was it. Um, so yeah, just very, very lucky. Like you say, that kind of butterfly effect. Had I not done this in my life, it wouldn't have led to that. It wouldn't have led to that. In a weird roundabout way, not to get too deep with it, but if I, <laughs> if I hadn't joined Cradle of Filth, my son wouldn't have been born. Yeah. Stuff like that, yeah. Because we, we met in a weird way through Cradle of Filth. So, um, and Charisse did. So it's, yeah, it's just one of those weird moments where, I don't know if you guys have this, but it's like the whole thing of how different would your life be had you not picked oh, up a yeah, yeah. My, I, I can't think of a, anything in my life that would be the same. Mm. Were, you, you, were, you, were, you, were you jamming with Rivers before you joined Cradle? Like, were you jamming with Harwell? Because when did These Wicked Rivers... I, 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 I really I wish know. I could do the, the exact date. date. If I did the date now, I'd look <laughs> so cool, but I can't fucking remember. <laughs> it was August 2014, I think. I, that's, think, that's, I think I was I was in Cradle at the time, but I was still in NG26, Emperor Chung, Strange Trio, <laughs> Cradle touring and writing. I was doing the musical theatre stuff. Uh, I was teaching full-time, and then it was... I think Dan actually sat me down and went, Rich, as much as we would love you to be in this band, we don't want to be the cause of you getting a mental breakdown, pretty much from just overloading yourself with commitments. So he did sit me down and was like, we, we want you in the band, but we've got to be honest with you, Rich, we think you're doing too much. So we'll, we'll make the decision for you. So I was technically sacked from these wicked rivers. <laughs> <laughs> But the look at my replacement, a very handsome man. Oh, thank you. Oh, superior beard. Bless it, bless it. Well, then, yeah. what I'm saying about the, the weird thing of, of, like, things happening in our life can be so different. Because if, if Dan hadn't had that conversation or you hadn't to join Cradle, like, obviously you might have remained with the boys. And and I didn't meet I didn't meet Hartwell um, if I wasn't doing a course with, with Mark Carver doing sound and stuff. And that got me into the get to know the boys. Mm -hmm. And then I met my Mrs. Jade through the band because she saw us in Wolves and and like my life would be completely different now in so many ways like we wouldn't have probably met yeah. me and Ryan we wouldn't be doing the podcast and obviously I wouldn't have met your lovely self you know and it's weird isn't it because all it took is is one moment or one decision and your entire life can be laid out a completely different way it's scary because I think it yeah. highlights the the frailties or the you know it shows how easily it can switch but it's also pretty amazing when you look at the whole the whole path it really is because it, it, it's that weird thing where it's something that happened in my life <laughs> altered yours. Yeah, it's crazy. You know I mean? it, it, uh, I'm not taking credit for it, but you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean though? I and mean, that freaks me out. Something completely unrelated to you, like that six degrees of um, separation kind of thing, can affect your life down, down the line. Oh, I find it freaky. I really do. I've had numerous conversations with my grandparents about this. They're like, if one thing hadn't had happened in their life, I would be it. That's you know what I mean? It's, it, it freaks me out. It generally freaks me out, but I'm fascinated by it at the same time. Yeah, it's amazing, man. It, like, particularly, yeah. you know, like, obviously your journey with Craig and then me with the boys. It's, it's weird that it comes back to that point as well. It's fucking, it's very strange. Now, in terms of that first tour, like, and what you're using now, gear-wise, like, you've, you're pretty well known for having a very limited rig, mm. uh, what you use now, haven't you? What was it like for that first tour? Did you literally just get what you, like, using what you've been given, or did you take something? Uh, the only thing I was told to bring were my guitars, just a main and a backup, that was it, because Cradle's one tuning, one tone, so it's literally like 
tuna. Bring a tuna. That was it. Bring a tuna. <laughs> two guitars. That's it. That's all. That's the whole rig. I need to bring. They provided wireless systems, the amps, everything, the the mics for the cabs, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so on that first tour, I was using. I had a choice between a Black Star Series One that belonged to Paul, um, or a Mesa Dual Rectifier. Mm-hmm. And I used the Black Star for the. Uh, rehearsals because these were just amps they had in storage like these god knows how many amps they had in there like well, one of these two would be good so i used that black star rehearsal and then the guitar tech came in and we used the black star as a backup and the guitar tech and the front of house guy was like please don't use the black star as <laughs> 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 horrible as it says and this is the thing it said they, they were like black stars are great but not for cradle of filth yeah. paul was endorsed by black star but they were never a big fan of the tone they got live out of it paul was so he used it but the guitar tech and the uh, front of house guy was like well please use the messer and in my experience i never got a messer to sound good and then the guitar tech showed me how to do it and i was like this could be the greatest amp i've ever played once you know how to use a messer i think they're one of the greatest amps on the planet but by god they're temperamental things uh but anyway so i was use, running through i don't even remember what the, the wireless was so i was using my prs through whatever wireless it was, uh, into a well, Boss TU2, the classic, and then it was the dual rectifier with a Rooster 2B12 cab. Have you heard of Rooster? No, no. No one has. This was one of the greatest cabs I've ever played through in my life. <laughs> so if you can track down a Rooster 2B12, buy it and thank me because honestly i've not played for a cab that's as good as that like ever and it, i don't even know what speakers were in it i have no idea what it was they just went this is a cab we got lying around and i was like i've never even heard of a thing it says no one has we just had it lying around play through that and that that was so that's what i used on the very first tour and then october 2014 we started touring russia so we did like a three-week tour of Russia, and they said, well, you're going to be lucky even renting, because obviously we're flying every day, so we're not shipping the equipment. So we're renting all the gear, and they said, well, we'll be lucky to rent even like a marshal. You just can't get all the marshals in Russia. Um, uh, so that's when we made the decision to go digital and use a Kemper, <laughs> which belonged to our tour manager. One belonged to the tour manager, one belonged to the uh, guitar tech. And then basically since then, we've been using variations of digital stuff we've we've used the mirror stuff we've used positive grid stuff and recently we've just switched onto the neural dsp quad cortex yeah, I've seen a lot about that. yeah it was really cool the first time i got to use it, it was at the live stream that we did um in may and that that was fun <laughs> using that because it's it's very cool very versatile piece of kit and it sounded awesome so looks like going forward we might be using that nice mm. nice man what are you dialing into the neural like because you, so you can basically pick your amp sim can't you you can pretty much it's like we've got a really good relationship with neural dsp like they send me all the kind of latest plugins and stuff that essentially you can put the plugins in the quad cortex if they don't come with it you can essentially like put them in and that's kind of what we were doing from the sounds of it so so we were using i think we we, we decided to use in the end one of the um gijira settings uh, if i remember correctly i think that one was based off an evh head because i know gijira use evhs which evhs are wicked amps so uh yeah i was happy with that Tell them, man. like i said we only need to worry about one good high gain tone so that's why we never got really picky we were like as long as it sounds good for that one thing we need we don't need all the bells and whistles but obviously you, you can't get stuff that's just one tone anymore <laughs> unless you go analog <laughs> mm. which i'd still like to go analog. i still like, like to use heads and cabs but for a touring band it becomes incredibly costly and almost not as good a tone either weirdly enough yeah well i've been 
you can cater every time you go to a different venue you've got almost like a different amp and you can you i think the problem when you have the same amp is you 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 go with your normal tone and every room's different so when you're going yeah. in you've got that solid you know digital sound you you're in the uh, front of house engineer i can imagine can can cater that for the room you're in and for the overall <laughs> sound to it whereas like, i go to every gig pretty much with the same amp settings <laughs> and i'll only dial them in based on certain if, I'm, if i know i'm not vibing i'll change it and dial stuff in yeah. depending on the monitor mix but it's not i suppose it's nice to have that that one less thing to worry about isn't it you know it's like a fresh start every gig pretty much because obviously in cradle we're incredibly lucky that we have a crew so we have guitar tech will talk with me and the sound guy to go right okay what kind of sound we're going for are we feeling it like and this is like day to day so we'll have a kind of set thing where it was good thing about the digital thing there's no mics <laughs> so there's no mics that can get knocked or you set up a different mic even like you're using like the house cables it's a slightly different house cable so the sound's going to be different does the valve might have been knocked slightly in transit little things like that whereas the digital stuff 99 percent of the time you can literally just plug in and play and you're like cool that's one less thing to worry about instead of that sound guy like spending like 20 minutes half an hour dialing in each guy's guitar tone for for the room he can go cool plug it in <laughs> there it is push the fader up cool it works next thing <laughs> um whereas when we were touring with heads and cabs uh, and mic positions and all that kind of stuff that that became quite difficult at times depending on the room because you will play somewhere that's like a 600 capacity venue then we'll play somewhere that's like a 5000 capacity venue and trying to get the amps to sound the same was very 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 difficult yeah. given the different size rooms we were playing night to night mm -hmm. um so obviously uh coming into an established band such as cradle of filth with like a strong leader as danny um that must be like an interesting dynamic for you uh coming in as like a, a songwriter as well um how how is that post like how does that work for you and um like the band like, like when you first came in and did the album like did you did you just come in or like did you have to sit back <laughs> No, weirdly enough, it was it was one of those things where I was honest with them from the start, and I think it's commonly known. I'd never played in a band like Cradle of Filth before. I'd never played in an extreme metal band. The, kind of the heaviest thing I did was prob was NG26, which was more kind of like in the Alter Bridge kind of Stone Sour kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, so nowhere near on, on the kind of extreme metal end. Uh, so I had a bit of trepidation writing, but because those guys are kind of like a well-oiled machine and they're used to writing for that band, it was really, I was really lucky because the first song I wrote, uh, which was a song that ended up becoming, it ended up getting on the album, uh, Hammer of the Witches, the first album I was on, that got a one word review from our drummer. And that word was shit. <laughs> and that's the first song i wrote and i was like oh right <laughs> wow okay back to the drawing board then and I, and I and it was one of those things where i was like well but i really like these riffs i think they're very cradle i think it works and i just emailed it back going right well why why is it shit why are you doing i mean not, not that i was like I'm not going to be the arse who's like, well, if you don't like it, sod it, I'm not going to write for you anymore, kind of thing. Like, I wasn't going to do that. I was just like, just out of curiosity, what, why doesn't it work? Yeah. And then when we got chatting and communicating, it was like, actually, this does work, but the structure may need a bit of fixing. And, all. and through that communication, it was like, ah, oh, I kind of get what you, what you want, and I trust you guys because you write for Cradle. You are Cradle. So, so guide me through it. And then after a couple of songs, I was like, okay, I get how this works. And then from then onwards, it was actually a very, well, relatively easygoing process. I come up with an idea, bounce it off for guys, and we'd literally like tweak notes here and there. And that goes for all of us. We tend, on the first two albums, it was like, we all write our own songs almost apart from the lyrics it's like musically this is this person's musically it's this person's and so on and so on and so on whereas on the most recent one that's not come out yet it was a bit more collaborative where it's like okay you've got a chorus i've got a verse you know what i mean <laughs> let's, let, let's put bits together don't get me wrong we were still writing like as songwriters 
like I'd have a song, for example, but there might be one bit missing, so somebody would come in. And basically everyone was doing that, so it was a bit more collaborative. And that's because I think over the years, we do know how to push each other's buttons more musically without offending each other about going, right, well, I think this could be better. All right, how? How do you want it to be better? And luckily we can communicate it because it must be very difficult working in a band where somebody goes, oh, I just don't like it, and they just don't communicate yeah. why. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have had that experience. I've had it a few times, and it's just it, it's pulling teeth. It really is where you go, you just don't want any of my ideas, do you? <laughs> I think that's really cool from the outset, because I think a lot of people imagine, because the band's so established at the point you've come mm. in, is that it will maybe be not a closed shop, but that obviously, like you said, the, the things are very much outlined, and this is your role, this is your role. Whereas I love the fact that you've actually developed as a band, you know, like a like a real, you know, like a, but it is a, you know, it's a real band. It's you've developed real, you, it really is unit you know and it's no different than me and the boys you know you as you get to know people you become more comfortable and you can you can grow and understand how to like you say to cater for each other's you know musical interests so that you you're constantly evolving so that's really cool that you've you've got to that point and hopefully that comes through on the new album mm. yeah i hope so because it's especially because we've got a new keyboard player in as well and she was very hands-on with the writing and very up for collaborating and it was very true that there was all six of us writing like and firing on all cylinders um in a weird way the pandemic kind of helped a little bit because we were we'd actually finished writing the album and i was in the studio recording i was just about to start recording guitar solos when the pandemic lockdown was announced so I was like, oh, well, it makes no difference to me. I'm in the studio anyway. It's like being locked away from the outside world until you're finished. And then obviously everything lasted a hell of a lot longer than we expected. But in a weird way, that it helped us out because it was like, okay, things we would we would sit on for a while. We now had time to go, yeah, now that we've heard it that many times, we that, that riff needs changing a little bit. And... Which was a bit of a ball, eh? especially when I just record, finished recording my guitar parts, and then we come back and go, "Yeah, we're going to change that riff." And you're like, "Really?" <laughs> but it did make for a better album because we did have more time to tweak those bits after multiple listens. So, so pandemic in a weird way, the pandemic, yes, it was crap for touring purposes, but it did help us out with this album just to go, "Okay, we don't need to rush to." get this album out because we, we finished touring in november 2019 and then we pretty much went in the studio in january i think january or february so we only had two months off the tour we were writing while we were on the road which cradle's never done that before but it, at least it made us go right at least we don't have to rush and worry about oh crap we need to get the album out by the time we go on tour and do all this 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 and this it's almost like everything got pulled out from under us and it was like okay well the only thing we can do is work on the album so let's listen to it with fresh ears no it's it's, it's a very positive out of it and i think and i'm looking for i can't wait to check out the album to hear that you know new writing process and that next evolution now one of the questions we ask a lot rich is which i think really relates to you in particular is that idea that when people go out on stage is that they're they're playing a character you know everyone's got their own identity and they slip into this different dynamic and you in particular as i say Mm. is is perfect for that like like obviously ryan's not met you before and he checked out the interview um with lee from anderton's and like commented how much of a lovely guy you seemed as such, such a dude and then you see your life yeah. and you're a beast <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so what's it like for you in terms of slipping into that and i think particularly with cradle you creating your own character to be a part of that of that beast you know what went into yeah. that it, it was really weird because at first especially on that very first tour it was like okay <laughs> first don't don't forget the songs like basically it was like just stand there and head bang don't get in anyone's way <laughs> you're the session guy you're you're employed to not fuck up basically <laughs> don't get in anyone's way do the show do it as well as you can that's it and then as i was staying in the band and even during that first tour it was like the more comfortable i got with it the more i was kind of encouraged to move around a little bit more and I think a lot of people think it's it's Danny and the filths, whereas Danny's like encouraging you to go, look, this is a 
band. This is like let the, if you feel like doing something, do it, and like don't don't feel like you're gonna piss anyone off because you've done something within reason, of course. Um, if I start doing like I don't know some forty one star punk jumps, I think they might be a bit like that's <laughs> that, weird. Like, I would... especially in new rocks, especially in new rocks and a trench coat. That'd be really weird. But um. But, but yeah, so, so it kind of morphed, like it evolved naturally. There was everything I do on stage was never like pre-planned. It was just like you you do something in the moment one night, and then all of a sudden people go, "That was really cool," either in the band or in the audience. But obviously, like I feel like I can't talk about this without talking about the metal elitists because obviously there's some people who just don't like the way i perform because it's not metal enough <laughs> um you know what and unless you've got you'll have basically head bang and play power chords that's metal and you're like well <laughs> that's boring that's what that is but <laughs> in my opinion but um yeah, so so you, my my style of performing, like some people don't like it, but some people absolutely love it. So it's it just naturally evolved, and it's not something I kind of think ahead of in time. Oh, at this point in the song, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It, it, I think it does. I think no matter what style of music you play and what kind of player you are, you do naturally develop an image of how you want to portray yourself and i think if you don't as long as you don't overthink it it doesn't become pretentious i hope even if you do just want to like shoegaze that's amazing if that's what feels comfortable then mm. all for it you know yeah was, was there anybody in particular over the years that's kind of got into your brain and kind of influenced you in any way like when you've grown up oh, that... God. yeah <laughs> this is the weird thing what from a performance point of view or because yeah, like i think people even if they're not completely aware they pick up little things yeah big they? time like, yeah. i've got little things that i know are, are subconscious oh god yeah <sighs> i think i mean just being a massive kiss fan there must be a little bit of kiss in me there that's weird to say out loud as well <laughs> i think a lot of people have had a little bit of kiss in them um <laughs> So, so there's, there's a little bit of a Gene Simmons thing going on. Uh, Hendrix, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's stuff that's probably completely unrelated to metal. Where, where I just probably even some musical theatre stuff where I was like, that's cool. Imagine if a metal band did that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, kind of like tweak it a little bit so it's a little bit more um, cradle friendly. Um, so I don't know if it. I'm just, I'm just a music geek. I just, I don't know about you guys. I just, I just listen to records and watch DVDs and YouTube or whatever of my favorite players and my favorite bands and stuff. Just, I suppose, just creeps in. I don't think there's any point where I've gone right. I'm going to do that move. I think it has been a very natural thing, but you don't realize how many different influences go into it. Mm -hmm. I like the musical theatre element because I yeah. think that links in really well with Cradle as well as you giving your own stamp on the band because it's that it's whole, it feels like a whole a theatre show mm. you know like a Very extreme theatrical. yeah extreme metal sort of you know you go it's an experience in some ways and I think what you bring to it is another element to that experience and I like the fact you you bring that classic side to it Rich mm. you know that bit of Gene Simmons you know I was when you was chatting about it I was thinking a lot about it. you said how much Queen was a big influence on you you know and and that's a very similar thing you know. Well, that's the thing. I think I was just drawn to more theatrical music, especially to start with. I think it was like, I don't know, I saw like Kiss and Zeppelin and Queen and the Beatles. They're almost like superheroes yeah. to me. You know what I mean? I think when I was a kid, it was like, obviously there was a music side of it, but the image side of it and how they carried themselves on stage, you were just like, oh my God, these people are just larger than life. Uh, Bowie, obviously, like it was, uh, any of those great like sixties, seventies, eighties bands that just had that extra something. Um, I was just drawn to it. And I still love it, um, but that's not to say bands that don't do much on stage or don't really have an image aren't cool as well because it's got to suit the music yeah. like if i did what i like but people find it really funny like they saw me playing in like pop covers bands and they're like you're very different to how you are when you're on stage with cradle of filth and i'm yeah. like no shit could you imagine if i actually was the same i was on cradle of filth for like i'd be sacked within about five minutes you know it's just not, it's just be the most inappropriate gig you've ever seen 
<laughs> it'd be like you know the drummer at the wrong gig have you seen that yeah yeah uh, where, where they're literally yeah. playing like and he's, he's killing it isn't he spinning <laughs> yes it's, it's, it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant but a guitar version of that where i'm like i don't know spinning and head banging and dribbling and i don't think it would really work when i'm playing hit me baby one more time you know i mean it's yeah, i love it i love the idea of it in my mind i'm not gonna lie it makes me <laughs> do you want to keep talking oh full, full <laughs> yeah uh, i don't know what all i can think of is oh, the, I a lot uh, all, I've got, all i've got in my mind is the image that you've been hired for some reason as a guitarist slash bingo caller <laughs> and you're in full cradle gear that's because that's all i've got in the center of my mind he's he just brilliant keeps, yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I'll add it to the CV. <laughs> that's <laughs> it. <laughs> that's my that's my new Instagram bio. I think it's going to be a bingo potential bingo caller. Bingo caller. <laughs> put, put my email um, for people to contact you with, and I'll manage. I'll manage the bingo caller side yeah. of it. Yeah, you you get the bingo bookings in, mate. <laughs> and, uh, it's good. Don't worry. We'll do a tour. Let's go on when when people are like, "When's your next tour?" I'm like, <laughs> "Bingo." Yeah. Tour. I'm doing like Petersfield. I'm doing Petersfield tomorrow. Like uh, <laughs> the next day. Oh, where are you playing? Oh, like good old bingo wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I sell it out. Sell it out, mate. Like, like, like amazing. People would lose a shit for it, man. <laughs> it would. It would. I think there's a new thing happening in there. Danny, yeah. like, I mean, yeah. that'd be chaos. <laughs> yeah. <It'd> be amazing. <laughs> Talk, talking about chaos, um, in terms of we've had a lot of stories on the podcast around like what it's like being on the road and mm. and all the different tour stories. And I imagine for yourself that's probably elevated because you go to different countries and you spend a lot of time on there. Have you got up to any mischief while you've been, mm. been out on the road? Lovely Richard. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I have. I will right, we'll move. We'll move. <laughs> <laughs> have you got anything that you can you can that we you can, can say you, yeah we can talk yeah, it's, it, it's one of those things but it, it's like pretty much to be fair we're just incredibly lucky that you do get to see lots of different cultures try all the different food that you only hear about like from <laughs> movies and travel documentaries or whatever you see p pictures on instagram of something the other side of the world go that looks nice shame we don't do it at our local tesco um i get to try out that, that stuff and, and i think i think that's the coolest part about touring you get to meet lots of different people and experience lots of cool stuff that y you wouldn't have done any other way what, what I'm afraid of like, yep. an amount of money on plane tickets and try, <laughs> trying to tour the world yourself it's you know what i mean so uh, i'm incredibly lucky that we get to tour the world and I get paid to do it. So it's, it's when, when I put it like that, it's not lost on me how lucky I am. I know I'm one of the lucky ones. I really am. No, that's cool, man. Do you have any Cradle Super fans? What, what are they like? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we've, got, we've, got, we've got a lot of them. We're really, really lucky. Some of them are uh, like the friendliest people you'll ever meet who are just... They just live and breathe Cradle. They know every lyric, every drum fill. You know, they, they, they go to every show on a tour and stuff like that. They, they release a new bit of merch like two days later. That person's posted on social media, go and got the new merch. It's like bloody hell. Like, it's amazing. And then you get some super fans who terrify you. <laughs> uh, genuinely, like, stalker territory where it's like okay yeah we have to like stop them coming to gigs and stuff we generally have it's like generally quite scary when that happens <laughs> it's uh yeah <laughs> there's been a few stories of that around the world where it's like right yeah that person don't let them in because they're actually a, a danger to the band and stuff like that it's it, which is harsh to say but it, it generally can get quite scary yeah in the name of being a fan, they can, they can go too far. So, yeah, but luckily it doesn't happen often. But most of the super fans are, like, the loveliest people you'll ever meet. Mm, no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, one thing that we like to ask on the show is kind of uh, what musicians do, like, away from the stage. So is there any kind of hobbies or anything that you picked up, like, over lockdown? Like, it seems as people have been shut away now <laughs> for a year. 
it, it, it's weird with me because I don't really have any hobbies. I mean, I, I, I like reading. I've always liked reading. So it was nice just to have a bit more time to read. Mm. I just was like, well, I'm not working as much. So I'll just sit and, and read. Um, and, and to be fair, most of the skills are like music related mm. where it was like, right, when I get time, I'll finally learn how to do this. That I've been saying for years, and all of a sudden it was like, here you go, here's that time you asked for. It was like, oh, right, well, I suppose it'd be a wasted opportunity if I didn't learn how to do it now. So, like, even just learning how to like self-record, like, I'd only really dabbled with it, like, before lockdown. It took me my third Cradle of Filth album to learn how to self-record, like, to do demos. I always used to go around my brother's house. And he'd record it all for me, and like, because he knows how to do all that stuff. And and thankfully, I learned just to do a little bit of it just before lockdown. And then when lockdown hit, it was like, well, now I've got the basics. That let me dive straight into it. And now I absolutely love it. And thankfully, I've been able to during lockdown do like guest solos for people, um, which have done some very very cool guest solos over the last year or so. And um, yeah, I think just learning more music based stuff like i never learned even with being a guitar teacher i never really sat and learned how to use like tabbing software and things but as, when everything became online lessons only and i kind of had to send things digitally it was like oh, i think it's time to learn how to do this now i've got like a massive catalog of cradle of filth songs and songs and exercises and licks solos transcribed that i use for my teaching and yeah my laptop's just full of transcriptions and never uh, ever find myself a bit bored it's like right, right let's transcribe that solo let's transcribe this song and so basically just still honing my musical skills weirdly enough but just in different ways so not just songwriting not just playing guitar it's doing a lot of other music related stuff mm, that's cool man yeah that's really cool um one thing that we like to kind of finish the show on uh, it's a bit of a hypothetical question uh, if you could tour with one band from the past and one band from the present, who would they be? <laughs> one band from the past. Mm. One. Yeah. One band. One, one from, from the, the present and one from the present. <laughs> Everybody struggles. Oh, you look like you say motherfucker with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really hard question. To Not the... <laughs> the... The one just because I'm just a fanboy would be Queen, you know what I mean? Like just from a back, like f even just to have seen Freddie would have been incredible. Just being in the same room as in witnessing what it would be, that would be very cool. Uh, but a band from the present, uh, these Wicked Rivers. Oh no, you can't! You can't drop the rivers card. Look how pretty. I can't do that. Is that not acceptable? Yeah, we accept it. I mean, it's, 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 it's which means not up to me. It's your band. No, I, I think you've got another one. I'm sorry, Rich. Oh, I've got to pick another one. But what era of Queen would you have? Mm. What era of Queen? Oh, no. Oh, are we going very, first two albums? Are we going sort of like the prime years for me up until or post 1980? Uh, what's what's your prime Queen that you'd love to gig with? Oh, God, see, I love every era. I'm that guy who even loves Hot Space, like that album. I love <laughs> Perfection, that is. <laughs> yeah, that's like Queen saying anger. You know what I mean? It's like, and I still love it. And saying that, I love saying anger. I'm that weird Metallica fan who loves saying anger as well. So it's. A bit, but I don't know. I think there's a magic about those first four Queen albums. Yeah. That for me can't be touched. I love everything they did after it, but there's just a magic period where you can hear the band becoming more Queen, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, like Queen One, yeah, it's like you can hear it, but it's like toned down a bit. It's like more Zeppelin <laughs> with bits of Queen. Queen Two, it's like, okay, now the prog side's coming out a bit more. Yeah, I'm liking this. Yeah, I know where they're going. Right, okay, well, at least we think we know where they're going. And then Sheer Heart Attack comes out, and then there's like, um, bring back Leroy Brown and stuff like that on it, where you're thinking, how oh, there? That was unexpected. Like, the kind of where they kind of went out and went, right, we can make any style of music our own. And then, boom, Night of the Opera. And it's like, in my opinion, the greatest album that's ever existed. Uh, so, 
that and Pink Floyd's The Wall are my joint top album so it's like yeah so i think the the, the first four queen albums there's a, there's a magic to it that can't be touched i agree i agree completely man I'm, I've, I've there's just... a kind of magic yeah well, i've just it... realized yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very nice very nice for everybody who didn't get that but... <laughs> You know, since becoming a dad, my dad jokes have become even worse. Right. They're like granddad jokes. <laughs> I already had dad jokes before becoming a, a parent. And what I was worried about happening has happened. And it's like they've got worse. You've evolved. You know, most, evolved. most people don't have dad jokes and then they get dad jokes. Because yeah. you've already got dad jokes, it's like it's, moved up it's evolved. Team. Uh, it, a granddad, I mean, Lord knows when it's going to go there. Knows. I, I, I'm kind of worried what's going to happen when I do go back on a tour and I'm stuck on a tour bus with like you know, 12 people where that's might be the only thing I, that will pop into my head is the, like, like dad jokes. <laughs> I'm really worried. I might not be in the band much longer unless I address <laughs> it. <laughs> 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 You get kicked out of Cradle of Filth for Grandad jokes. Yeah. I mean, that is the headline nobody expected. It's rock and roll. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm really worried that might actually happen because, don't get me wrong, Danny Filth loves a good dad joke, but there's a line, you know? <laughs> I, I think I overstepped. Oh, you got too far, Rich. <laughs> oh. yeah. So you're having, so your, your band from the past is the um, first four or five albums, Era Queen, up to mm-hmm. nice mm-hmm. What's your band from the present? Mm. Can't have these wicked rivers. <laughs> Which is, I appreciate it. There's so many. Oh, that's a really tough question. The first one, I don't know why, but the first one that's pop well, the obvious one, to be fair. I was going to say another band, but there's an obvious one, which is Ghost. Mm. Because obviously I I, I was in a ghost tribute band, which it's really hard to convince ghost and Cradle of Filth fans that I wasn't a nameless ghoul when (laughs) you're a tribute band. It's like, you know that tribute band I was in that was touring at the same time as Ghost? Yeah. Well, that means I physically can't be in Ghost then. <laughs> like, But they still believe I've, I've been a nameless ghoul at some point. And I, 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 to be fair, if I ever was a nameless ghoul, I think it would, I'd find it really hard to stay quiet about that. No, so, no, no, don't get me wrong. I know I've known past nameless ghouls. I know current nameless ghouls. And I'm still going... <laughs> So when you get me in, and it just, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I would, I'd scream it from the rooftops if it eventually happened, but I'd, I don't see it happening. <laughs> Too much stuff playing with Cradle. But Ghost would be very, very cool. Really cool. I mean, that works. I like the idea of having Queen and Ghost on the same lineup. Yeah. You know, it's both sort of very theatrical, very classic in its own way. I'm and just a big sucker for the big stage show. Mm, yeah, and, that's what it is, really. You know, classic. <laughs> 70s influenced if not actually 70s music sound I mean, and who, who would you open them with would you open them with ng26 just for just for romance yeah uh these wicked rivers <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would slot in beautifully in that game <laughs> well our Harwell's, Harwell's a very similar performer to freddie and yeah and uh, from, uh, from I mean, Ghost. you barely know that they've changed. I mean, Hartwell <laughs> might be the lead singer of Ghost. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. We don't, we don't know. No. Anyway. You know, he's a very mysterious man, is John Hartwell. Mm. So we'll, we're not sure. But I'd, I'd love to see you in Ghost, Rich. I think that would be the next the next evolution of, of Rich Shaw. Okay. <laughs> it, it would be very cool. Like, like I said, I do know some of the name of schools. I just keep going, I need to actually put a word in. <laughs> Make it a tour you can't do, let me know, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to be home for like your grand's birthday, let, let me know, I'll fill in. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, he's always waiting in the wings, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it would be very cool. It's like I know the songs already, you know, you know what I mean, from the tribute band. It's like, look, it's gonna take poor girl rehearsal, <laughs> which is a technically cheaper option because you don't need to spend as much time rehearsing with someone. <laughs> So, <laughs> I feel like we're now I'm part of your... with every band that I work with. It's look, look I'm the cheapest option. Right. Any demos <laughs> I'm doing by the deadline. It's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. like you don't mind granddad jokes. Mm. I'm, I'm your man. And, and and if you don't like granddad jokes, I'll just be quiet. You know what I mean? Like, I'll just be happy to be there. You know what I mean? I'll just sit in the corner <laughs> and 
write down my granddad jokes for a future like book or something. <laughs> I've got to store them up somehow. You know, <laughs> amazing. Right? Ooh, Do we, have we got a release date for the new Cradle record yet, Rich? Mm. Not, not yet. I, I've been told a release date, but I can't say yet just in case it does change and uh, or pandemic based but it is definitely this year there's going to be a couple of singles come out pretty soon because we've already shot a couple of music videos uh, uh for the album so hopefully they'll be coming out very 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 soon from, from what i gather uh but the album yeah it will be coming out this year and then we'll fingers crossed we'll be back touring from October, from the sounds of it, we've got plans for October onwards. But we've had plans for a very long time, but the plans keep changing. But uh, from the sounds of it, October is what we're working towards. Cool. Right. Mm. Nice one. Thanks ever so much for joining us, Rich. For those that haven't checked out our Cradle of Filth, you know, what, what are you doing? It's a long okay. time. And the thing oh. is, it's, Rich brings something to Cradle that makes it a little bit more accessible for the more classic rock fan, you know, because of these more classic sort of performance. And I think it is an experience that everybody needs to have mm. going to see Cradle of Filth, you know, just one to tick off the list. And I'd definitely <laughs> recommend it with Rich in tow. And Rich is also on his own social medias. When he goes back to touring, he's very good at sharing where he's been and what he's doing around the world. So that's it's always cool to check out and you also still doing your guitar lessons rich i'm still doing guitar lessons yeah the whole time i'm not on tour i'm still teaching awesome so if anyone's interested in that how can they get to you to do that mm. uh any of my socials so facebook or instagram just uh, richard shaw guitarist fantastic and make mm. sure you do that because um rich is an awesome guy and an awesome teacher and he's got loads of expertise not just for cradle but all across the board so i'd recommend but yeah thanks ever so much for chatting to us brother it's good to see you man mm. and you and you take care thanks for having me on guys appreciate it yeah, cool, brother. cheers yeah and now can hear that now that's pretty much the similar levels of cock up as, as your introduction to the uh, to the cradle interview. Well, I mean, you've got to, you got to admire me on my commitment because I could have said we're doing all of that again. No, <laughs> he kept it in, which is to his credit, definitely. And we're about 20, 28 episodes or something deep now, and he's done it for everyone. So exactly. fair, fair play. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. I mean, I, I know Rich quite well, as, as he revealed in the interview, because mm. he, he knows the boys in Rivers, and he was. I did replace him. In, it's uh, really play. interesting he, that he's... He wasn't good enough. Yeah. He wasn't good enough. <laughs> so I had to come in and say, look, I saw it out, boys. Don't... Dan, don't worry, it's going to be all right. Um, but no, it was, it was interesting. We had that lovely moment, didn't we, where we reflected on our lives. Could have been very different. Mm. You know, obviously, Rich met his missus through Cradle and had the baby. I met Jade through Rivers. You know, it's it's very interesting, that six degrees of separation. You know, obviously, me and you probably wouldn't have met. You know, yeah. it's, it's very interesting, man. And like, we wouldn't be doing this right now. I know, it's, it's bizarre that... Uh, I didn't even know him, and he had an impact on on what I what I've been doing. You didn't say thank you. <laughs> you. you were horrible. You were very rude. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I I enjoyed just understanding the dynamic of Cradle and, mm. and his role in all of that. And and I I was excited for him to go back gigging. I was thinking mm. I didn't say this to you, but I was I was listening to him chatting. I was thinking oh, I bet he's absolutely. God, dying to go back because he's not like any of us because that's his main gig yeah it's like like and to suddenly have that pull the rug pulled from under your feet it's like cause that's must mean so much to him to go back and play in front of him it's, it's not that like a lot i play love playing in front of five ten people fifty or hundred you know but to play in front of a full arena of people that genuinely adore what you're trying to do i mean mm. to lose that is 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 a big thing you know and he's an ultimate performer ultimate professional and it's i think he can't get, wait to go back to doing what he does best yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, obviously they're the most out there band that we've had currently compared to the the um, the bands that we've had. Put them in Anvil on about the same, same <laughs> thing because Anvil can get pretty, you know, yeah, pretty, pretty dark, man. <laughs> Mofra, terrifying. terrifying yeah. <laughs> but, but this is it. They're, they're definitely the most theatrical band we've had today. Yes. Um, and it, it it's just interesting hearing like a glimpse into that that world isn't it because it's a very different um just a whole different dynamic and and style and approach um 
but at the same time it's interesting seeing you know a guy that would go out there and as we spoke about wear all the makeup and all this that and the other and he and you know we we, we sit down and chat with him and it's like an all guy from Derby yeah, he's you so know? Derby yeah. you know, we, we joke about <laughs> in the band is like you chat to when he gets interviewed for Cradle and he's like yeah alright you know, yeah, yeah. Right. very Derby bless him uh, but he's a lo- lovely guy which, mm. you know, and I like that he's kind of like that question we always ask about being a character that's the ultimate thing isn't it he's yeah. dressing up and he's being a character mm. you know and he's performing in that in that mode you know and I think we all do that in different ways and it's just maybe amplified a bit with the theatrical side of Cradle but no enjoyed it man it was a good episode good interview yes and uh, yes and uh, that is it for this week but uh, if you like what we're doing uh, why not follow us on Facebook where you'll find that every Wednesday we have a new teaser with a new guest we do indeed and if you're watching on YouTube you can press below subscribe mm. and click the little bell and you'll never miss an episode but as Ryan said we have episodes every week Saturday 10am with different guests so it shows our variety we have Cradle of Filth mm. and then we have new wave of classic rock artists we have older rock artists you know we we try and be quite diverse don't we Mr. Basie yes it could literally be anyone but it's not going to be you it unless unless you're be. watching then it might be you I don't know it might be oh, I don't know see, send us an email see what <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, appreciate the support, but get on YouTube because mm. you can have a look at our mugs and you can have a look at Ryan's um, hot, sexy leather pants. Yes. Um, I mean, as we know that most people do tune in for the leather pants. Uh, it's the only reason <laughs> I'm actually here. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, we will see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>